to the Trinity Force Podcast. Yo, it's that Triforce cast beaming straight to your home. Grab a beer so we know Pony drinking alone. Send an email, a quick tweet, just pick up the phone. Leave a message, hit the beep if you're a creep, watch your tone. Discuss the meta game, patch notes, whatever helps your stats most. Obi Pwn Kenobi is your last hope to snatch gold. So grab your headphones and join in the fun. We'll try and force in some jokes and some cringeworthy puns. Yo, we can make it together, people. Trinity Force Podcast. Voice is second to none, but that's the end of the intro, it's time to begun. Hello, everybody out th- out there. It's episode 497 of the Trinity Force podcast. I uh, <laughs> I got new headphones, and they're definitely better than the Skull Candy headphones I got, because the intro music, well, these guys can't hear it, sounds way different. It's kind of crazy <laughs> what, what a decent pair of headphones will do for right? you. Right? Uh-huh. Been using a shitty pair of uh, skull candies for I don't know two or three years now, and I was like, I should probably splurge because they did this. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't want that in your ear. Yeah, that might never come out of your ear. Yeah, right. So anyway, for those out there in podcast land, the the my earbuds split, but that's not here or there. Uh, this is episode four ninety seven of the Trinity Force podcast. I am getting over a cold, so excuse me if I am less than excited tonight. But uh, we're gonna try to make the best out of it we can. I'm also gonna try not to cough in your ear. Um, and speaking of trying to cough in your ear, Heartless Beaver is putting together a new podcast for Patreon at five dollars a month, and he's going to try to bring people on that don't cough in your ear as well, right? It's going to be very fun, guys. You should subscribe. It's going to—I got lots planned for it. So, um, I haven't a hundred percent lined up the first guest, but I, I won't spoil. Oh, awesome! It should be fun, though. Yeah, should we'll, be fun. We'll get that one kicked out within the first week of January. It's uh, storming hard up in Canada here. We got a got a snowstorm warning. We got about twenty five centimeters of snow today. So for you Americans, it's like I don't know, ten eleven inches something. You got that much snow? Yeah, in one day. Jesus Christ! It was <laughs> seventy degrees. I was wearing shorts today. Yeah, dude, it was cold here. Jeez, oh Pete. So yeah, well, stay warm with the podcast. Stay inside. Listen to some podcasts. Maybe record a couple as well. That's what I, I know. There, I know there were some boys out listening in the Okanagan. They know what's going on. The snowstorm city. I, I did. I did get uh, attacked by French Canadians the last time we talked about Canada. So yeah, I have no idea what's going on on the East Coast, but you guys are probably closer than me. At least Dom is. <laughs> <laughs> Dom's kind of in the middle. You know, yeah, yeah, I'm not the. Uh, I'm not close enough to really be affected by what's going on over there. Not by a long shot. So, yeah, we, we wanted to jump in tonight. Uh, that's patreon.com forward slash T-Force Network, by the way. Check that out. Budaboxers.com forward slash T-Force, our other sponsor. You can go pick up some awesome pairs of boxers with them. You know all about them by this this point. If you don't, uh, bamboo boxers made to fit and be super comfortable. They're awesome. But uh, Budaboxers.com forward slash T-Force. But tonight we wanted to make a chill stream because the, the last episode you listened to was, uh, what was it, patch 7.24B with yeah. Dom and Maroon or uh, Marine. It's a bit of a grind, was it? <laughs> Just uh, it was. I had to read through, those, and it looked. Uh, it it looked was one great. of those patches where it kind of felt like all of the changes were pretty self-explanatory. So we still like to run them down for our listeners because I know. A lot of people just sort of wait to hear about the changes until the show instead of reading them themselves. But as far as like providing analysis or anything, it was like, yeah, uh, this champ really struggled because of the runes, and so he's getting buffed. So, yeah, I mean that, that's that's kind of what it felt like. Yeah, we'll have to see. Ho- hopefully, people found uh, some use out of that. Sorry, they, people got there get to see my Slack. I'm actually uh, reading chat. There was a question that came out in chat right now. We'll try to answer that later. If you could stick around, if not, just catch this podcast because we'll hit listener questions at the end, um, and and we'll answer this one that came in from uh, Rillium. Anyway, tonight we kind of wanted to take this time to talk about our year in review and how we can use that to decipher it to make us better players coming to coming into 2018 in the new season. Uh, this isn't a way for us to brag uh, through our year in the review, but rather this is what our stats are and this is how we're going to use this to try to make us better players and what we're going to uh, do by reviewing them. Now, let's face it, there probably is going to be bragging. <laughs> well, excuse me, only from you, Dom. Well, but the- I had a year. <laughs> he had a good year, right? I so had a it, year. If you haven't checked out your re- year in review, log into League of Legends and then click on the year in review tab under home, and you'll find that there. And it'll be all about uh, your year in review in 2017. The ones that we're going to really focus on this evening are the Summoner Rift stats, though, because there's a lot of good ones here. And then as you scroll down, there's a few other stats about your specific champions and 
um, best and worst matchups. So, uh, and also there's also at the bottom you can compare yourself to other players of the of the same rank as well to get an idea of what your KDA, for example, does compared to everybody else. But we'll start here, and you know we'll start at the just the Summoner's Rift overall. So when we're looking at these stats, I want to throw this out to you guys. Uh, what do you think for like deaths, average deaths per game? What do you think is a good number that should be sitting here? Uh, I mean, four and a half. You know, five maybe should be is, is where I think uh, a good number would be. I think obviously it depends on what level of the game you're playing at, but yeah, somewhere around five is what you should at least be aiming for. But depending on your role too, like uh, top laners, you're probably expected to die a little bit more if you're playing tanky characters, and uh, AD carries also probably die more because of assassin coverage. But everyone else should be aiming for like four or five <laughs> or better. If you're in the six range, I think you're dying too much. Yeah, for sure. If I mean, I'm sitting at five point four, so I'm dying a little bit too much, mm -hmm. a little more than I should be. I should. I want. I'd aim to get that down to about four and a half. I think this season, trying a little better positioning, dying less in lane. But uh, we've also had a pretty hard year as eighty carries. Well, I mean, you also had a pretty good <coughs> spell, so it should have evened out well, theoretically. Yeah, you're right. Um. Yeah, I'm sitting at 4.3, which I'm pretty happy with because I play a lot of engagey tank champions, especially in ranked. I think this is just ranked stats, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, I think it's just ranked. Well, I mean, it, it tracks Howling Abyss separately, but I think I think everything else is just ranked. Yeah, so it's not it's not too bad. I but, expect your KDA to be pretty high, Adam. Yours 2.6. 2.6, which is yeah. actually above average. Mine's three. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty far above average as well. I'm not 100% sure what average is, but uh, even aiming for something like two is 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 pretty good, you know? An average, it, a good KDA is two, right? So anything above two is above average and good or great. That's true. Because, yeah, I mean, just look at it, right? You, you two, two point, right? Two, if you had an even two in KDA, every time that you've died, you brought two people with you, essentially. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah, it's pretty good. good. I expect Dom's to be high too because he's a support player. My KDA, uh, three point five. Yeah, that's expected. <laughs> I, I expect support stuff that highest KDA of all the members on on the Rift. To be honest, they're just involved in too much, and I expect top laners by the same token to have the lowest KDA. So a KDA doesn't necessarily mean you're doing well, though. So you have to sort of look at all these stats together, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's the same thing, right? If we look at average kills, a support player probably doesn't have that high of an average kills. Right, Dom? Mm -hmm. Mine's 1.5. Right. Then that's what I would expect out of a support. Any two and under. And then anybody else should be five or above, to be honest with you. Yeah. Like, if, if you... When we say these stats, like, if you're, you know, five or above in your average kills per game, that means you're doing good enough to be gold or higher, Right. Because you you've got you, you it's it shows me that you know enough about team fighting and the game and, and trading that you are trying to keep yourself positive and using that you know using your advantages properly. Mm -hmm. So gold per minute one is a really hard one to dissect because like if I scroll down and look at the gold per minute, I've, I think I'm technically under gold players for gold per minute. Yeah, by just a hair, right? So like uh, uh, technically my gold per minute is just above silver players. Which is yeah. You know, so for those of you who haven't looked, you can go, you can scroll down to the bottom and check against average players for a certain level, right? Well, and even that's a little tricky to use because like the average gold support actually makes slightly more money than the average plat support. True. Like so, yeah. It's just it just kind of shows where you're, how you perform against you know that specific field, and, and so you know, it's not like. You know, it, it, it's not like uh, all of a sudden plat players are, you know, just have a, a one kill a game higher KDA or something, you know. Yeah. So just judging from my bars, I'm better than all diamond players at everything except warding. I can't ward apparently very well. <laughs> well <laughs> which is fair and I should probably work on it more, but that's because I don't buy the green uh, the green enchantment only on Sejuani. Yeah, and uh, judging by mine, I'm better than all challenger players except for gold per minute and mm -hmm. uh, damage per minute. So you have to sort of take it with a grain of salt, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. 
Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't compare yourself to Ark. Apparently, my KDA is better than Challenger players, but it's right. Just, it's just a nice thing to have an idea of where you at. I would say if you're within a point or you know, fifty CS or fifty gold per minute or something of anybody, then you're mm-hmm. doing fine. Like you're you're average you know, or above average at that point. Like if you're looking at something where like your wards per game are two, but the average is nine, then maybe we should stop and take a look at that and see what we're doing wrong. Yeah, I, I think one of the best parts about this is it sort of breaks down which champions you play and tells you how well you're doing on them. Um, it literally says champion breakdown. So it, that sort of gives you an idea what champ- what kind of characters you're good at and what, what you're not. So if you're struggling going into the next season, I know their suggestions are god-awful at the end, but um, maybe just do some research online or even send us in a question. If you know you say, like, I like playing Ari, who are some mages that are similar to her because I can't master um, you know, Fizz, for example. That would be something that you could uh, you could send our way. Maybe we could help you with. Yeah, we've done that. We've we've done that for folks in the past, especially mm-hmm. on the on the subreddit. I know it's a little <laughs> quiet there these days, but I know all the or most of the hosts kind of you know keep their eyes on it. And we might not get to your question, you know, within minutes of you posting it, but we definitely do try to get back to you, at, you know, at some point. But you know, continually to, to look at some of these stats and what you can use them for is. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out exactly, you know, where our weak spots are. And so you look at your total KDA, we kind of give you some ideas, right? Like if you're at 2 KDA, you're doing good. If you're under 2 KDA, you need to work on it. But taking that and looking over at it, compare, comparing it to the overall of the gold, silvers, and whatnot, and if there's something that's sitting there that screams at you, I think this is a good opportunity for you looking at this to either write us, again, write us in and say, what can I do better? And all I'm going to say is, well, ward some more spots, listen to some more shows. But I'm actually curious. I should have looked up. You know who I'm going to look up? Can I can I search for names right here? Yeah, you can. Does, does... Yeah, you want to see the warding stats for Chira? I was wondering if this was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> does the guy not ward or what? That's the joke. Uh yeah, his average wards are 9.2, which is average for anybody um, in any rank, right? Even challenger players, only 9.2 wards. Yeah, his is higher than mine, so I mean... Is it really? Yeah, mine's 8.8. Man, you're bad at warding. <laughs> I'm not bad at warding. I just put strategic wards down that catch a lot of people. <laughs> Few wards is not strategic wards. No. Is it a jungle thing to have a high KDA? I'm curious now because Beaver had a high KDA and Shira's got a higher, you know, high one as well. well I wonder if it was just that year, which jungler's been powerful the, almost all year. Well, junglers, junglers are always powerful. The thing is, like, when you're playing jungle, since you have such a strong influence over the early game, you can often uh, get involved in pretty much everything going across the map. And if you get fed, then you'll be involved in pretty much every kill, I would say, at least 90%. Um, and if you're behind sometimes you're just not involved in the action to be honest like you're just cruising your jungle trying to farm up while your team is feeding their asses off and that also happens so it kind of makes your kda seem a little higher than than normal (laughs) whereas when you're playing a an ad carry you know their their mid laners and uh assassins are always looking to to kill you so i can see how it would be a little bit lower on a on an ad carry or someone squishy like that that's just my personal thought but that's his professional opinion. My professional opinion. My semi-pro, not pro opinion. As right he rubs there. his hands together, we can hear it through the microphone the entire time. Oh yeah, sorry about that. My hands are frozen. It's the wasteland that is the Okanagan right now. I I know I know what you mean. Mini, Minneapolis is not. Uh, probably not much more. Uh, probably not much warmer. You know. I apologize for the uh, for the hand rubbing sound you just received in your ears. Wear some goddamn gloves. You fucking. <laughs> in my house. Life. Yes. No, it just makes me feel bad. So here's the question. Pentakills. How many pentakills this season? Dom, zero. Two? Oh, are those from... Do they, they must count... It doesn't, uh, it doesn't say where it's from, so it's got to count ARAMs, although... Right. I got three. Yeah, look at that. Three. I think there's still people out there that have ever had zero pentakills. I know one of mine was with Zaya, because I remember like the first week she came out, I got a pentakill with her. Yeah. Right. And the double kills. This this is called being a bottom lane. Four hundred fourteen, <laughs> right? Well, I have I have four hundred eighty one, so it's not unreasonable. Also depends on how many games you played this season, right? So I brought my OB.GG. I'm pretty sure I played like one hundred twenty games of ranked. Yeah, mine was way less. Yeah, I played one hundred twenty. So yeah, 
I mean, either way, if you've played over 50 games, I say these stats are pretty pretty accurate for what you need to work on. Yeah. Sure. Is there anything else in these stats people can use uh, or, you know, how they should be using them? I mean, I really like the the comparison against, uh, you know, sort of the field of players. You know, it's it's probably less useful the higher up you go. And I, I wonder if by the time you hit plat, it's really difficult to glean a lot from the the stats but you know if you're in silver you know i think it would be really useful to to compare yourself against the field of bronze players and see you know what does the the average bronze bronze player at the the role i prefer playing you know how do they perform and how am i performing relative to that and everything and then compare yourself to the field of uh, uh you know that you're in and then comparing you know yourself to the the one right above you uh, i think that's really useful because even just scrolling and, and um sort of selecting everything, you can see the incremental growth, you know, just from the the bronze field to silver and then silver, silver to gold and that type of thing. There's actually a decent jump between bronze and silver as well. Yeah. Uh, considering average CS per minute for an AD carry jumps up by one, like, and that's a lot, right? Just one extra CS per minute. And I mean, it's... It's about <laughs> one for every... Well, it's not one, it's 0. 0.2, 0. 0.1, but it's literally one. Everything else is anywhere from... 0.1 to 0.3 but bronze and silver players is one mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, some of these things don't really make sense like average healing is kind of a useless stat depending on what characters you play same with average damage mitigated and well i, I think really gold per I mean, minute kda wards per game and damage per minute are the ones that you kind of want to focus on well, see, for me, average damage mitigated and average healing, those are really important stats. You know, if I'm if I'm mitigating 11.8k damage per game, you know, that means I'm doing really well with uh, with Janna or, or Lulu or, or Karma or something, you know? Yeah, like, but that's what a big are, deal. What are they comparing you to? Like, the whole field of, like, like let's just say gold players? Are they comparing to you just people who played support? It's just support. Okay, I see. Yeah, because, because you can because... click right here. Bottom and jungle are my two roles that I played most this season. So you, right. can, you can click on... Like, I can click on jungle and see that bronze players only have two death. Oops, shoot. Two and... Um, you know, you get it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay. You got challenger yeah. level stats there, Beaver, with your KDA. Jungle KDA. <laughs> yeah, but I mean... There's a lot of other things that I don't possess that challenger players do, I like know. game knowledge. Well, that's the thing that I want to point out here, too. I want to point Still out. shot accuracy. Really, yeah, you can't just go on the stats, right? Right, because if, you know, I just said, right, like, man, you know, he, he's got over a 3.0 KDA. He must be a challenger player. Well, you could have the most amazing stats in the world, but if you're not, if, you know, you're not rotating, taking down towers and doing that, if you're just... You can easily sit in lane the entire game, get rack up and pad your stats really high. Yeah, this, do nothing. these stats don't tell you the mistakes you make, which is the main reason, like the main like medium through which people can get better at the game is by f reducing the amount of mistakes they have, which will inherently increase your stats, right? So if you try to save your teammates less when you know they're dead, your KDA is going to go up because you're going to die less, which naturally means that your gold per minute is going to go up. Um, you know, stuff like that. Just having good, learning good positioning, proper positioning when he carries means that you're gonna deaths are gonna go down, average damage is gonna go up, average healing is gonna go up, all this stuff is gonna go up. So it's all like related to each other. I mean, it, yeah, and just to sort of like like juxtapose that, you know, you you look at uh, traditional sports and everything, uh, and uh, you know, Giancarlo Stanton, who's a, a power hitting outfielder um for the miami marlins and everything you know he, he crushed i don't know how many home runs last year let's let's quick look it up i don't play baseball so i know i'm just but it's just like he, he crushed <laughs> however, you know how, how however many home runs in the the regular season he uh 59 59 home runs 132 runs batted and everything those are insane numbers well the marlins still only won 77 games which is a sub 500 record you know stat <laughs> putting up good stats is important and it's important to you Absolutely. know it helps you figure out what your strengths are but putting up like just putting up good stats isn't necessarily what's going to win you a game you how know? many games total right. do they play is your point being 160, that 162 games a year it's your point being that it's a team game <laughs> Yeah, not basically. just a stats game. But but even you know at the individual contributor level, your your decisions should be focused on what it's going to take. Like your 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 decisions should focus on winning the game. Everything you do, like the the end goal, should be 
how getting one step closer to winning a game, not you know one point higher on your stat of choice. Because mm -hmm. if you're playing, if you're just playing for KDA and everything, like you're gonna you're gonna naturally start being really really cautious with a lot of your decisions because dying less is is you know automatically going to uh, raise your KDA. You definitely want to die less and everything, but that doesn't mean you can't take risks. So wait. Every third game he was hitting a home run or every yeah, less than ba that. Basically. I know we're going back to baseball here, but that's pretty phenomenal, man. No, yeah, what's, the, what's the what's the all-time high? Is it the young Barry Bonds? Yeah, 73, 72, something like that. Okay, so, so that's every other just about every other game he was smacking a home run. I mean, that's yeah. pretty phenomenal too. Yeah. Right. You know, it's you I mean that's the type of player that you want to have on a team and somebody who is like a, an effective contributor on a on a per game basis. And that's what I guess that's what the, where these stats help you. You know, it understands what you're doing on an average game and and I guess it helps you know what standard to hold yourself. You know, understanding that game length is going to vary. Um and so, you know, if a game is really short, well your wards per game is going to uh drop, for example, or your or your um gold per minute might might fall a little bit because there are fewer kills going around. Uh, but you know, you, you understand what standard you should hold yourself to, uh, how you can make incremental improvements. But now that you know how to kind of gauge your own performance and, and what, what you should be doing, you, you also can now start translating that into, into results in the game. Um, you know, and you, you can say like, you can go back and sometimes look and say, okay, you know what? My team didn't drag me down. I dragged the team down because mm -hmm. looking at the, the way I normally play, you know, using these stats, uh, I, I was below that mark in a lot of cases. You know, you can't just you can't just blame the the jungler for not ganking your lane, even though that sure feels convenient and like the the thing that you want to do. Or you it can't... feels real good, doesn't it? I lost <laughs> lane because of my jungler. Or you can't you can't blame the support because uh, laning didn't go your way. You know, you died a bunch. You were the AD carry and you died a bunch. It's maybe not the support's fault. Maybe it's your own. You know, looking at your own numbers. Yeah, but that's yeah, classic personal accountability, which we talk about all the time. Yeah. So you know, if if, wanna... if these numbers tell me anything, or should tell you anything, it's that my Karthus and that Karthus was really right. good last season. And more <laughs> people should have played him. I had a seventy three point three percent win rate on Kar Karthus last season. Now, granted, many... we don't know how many games that's over because they don't tell us. But it still, tell you. nah, they don't. You can click on it. There's nothing. It's just a picture. You just look it on your OPR TG. <laughs> Yeah, the win rate thing is pretty important. Like my most played champ was Warwick, and I had seventy two percent win rate, which was extremely high. Yeah, my most, my highest win rate champion was Lulu, and uh, she was also my most played champ. So mm -hmm. yeah, sixty four point four. So that's uh, but seventy me, games. My second most played was Master Yi, and I had a fifty six percent win rate, which isn't terrible, but still. With about the same amount of games, it's pretty obvious that my playstyle suits someone who's a little bit tankier, um, because I like to engage on my enemy making a mistake. So that's something I'm going to use moving forward into next season. Thinking about maybe another champion or two I might want to pick up. Uh, I'm not the rank season. <coughs> uh, pardon me. I'm I'm not reading too much in the most played champs uh, or, or or the winningest stats because. You know, this season from a support standpoint was pretty much defined by champions that were heal. You know, using heal and shield power and everything, uh, and, and so it just, it, you know, I I know why I was picking those champions. Yeah. Well, this has to be taking into normals into account, um, unless the API is funky. Because uh, my Jin in season seven, I had forty five played and ranked at a fifty three percent win rate, and this has sixty five games played. So I have to imagine that extra 15 games or so, 20 games, um, mm. is coming from normals. Let's, uh, let's look at OPGG. Mine, I, my, what That's mine what I'm looking does, at is OPGG. Is it, it's coming from um, Flex and Solo Q combined. Right, but that's what OPGG put together, and the yeah. season seven was flex and solo queue, and this that's what this has to be throwing flex solo queue and and draft all in one. I don't know. I don't think it puts draft into it. I don't know. It's got to because it because because according to this, Adam played forty five games on Jin, and according to Riot stats, he played sixty five. Right. So mm -hmm. there's yeah. some disparity there. Okay, well maybe it does factor it in, but still, <laughs> right, still. Uh, Revealing, I guess. I mean, it's still good to know and everything. I mean, it, obviously, it's going to um, change things a little bit if you went into, 
you know, normal Q games and you just didn't care and you were you were fucking around all the time. Well, yeah, that's going to hit your stats these, a bit. But these kind of stats have always been available though through third party sites, right? Like OP.gg and for the most part. I don't know. There's other ones where you can look up your own summoner. I can't remember off the top of my head. But then you can compare to the wider field. Um, so the stats have always been out there, but now the fact that they're embracing them and keep throwing them in your face is uh, maybe going to be useful for some people who are maybe denying their, uh, you know, what's stopping them from climbing. Hopefully that's hopefully that's just you. You're stopping them, right? Like just yourself. Mm-hmm. You're, you're stopping yourself. No one else is stopping you because yeah. at the end of the day, you're the only person you can you can control. It's true. Such great advice. <laughs> well, actually, as you can hear, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is giving out as we continue to talk because I'm getting over a cold. But I think we've we've pounded stats into the head in the game. I really want I want to talk to this Twitch. There's this question that came in real quick before we killed this out because, like I said, this is the end of the year show. It's just we want to make it quick, kind of give you guys some ideas. There's really not too much to talk about as a lot. There's not really a lot of people playing the game right now, thanks to the holidays and Christmas is next week as well. And so we'll be hitting it hard once the new year hits. But uh, so Raylium, he wrote in, and I'm gonna try to read this. I'm gonna take a drink. Uh, finally caught you guys live. Thank God. Got a question for Heartless. I found myself stuck in diving style junglers for success, aka Rexai, Vi, Zen, and Panth. I was an old Eve main, and her style worked similar, similar with her rework. I found myself very impatient and just not very good in early game with her anymore, like the older other dive style champs I play. Please help me. I still want to main her. How do I how do I play Eve better? Why can't I play her like I used to play her? What were the three champions you mentioned? Sorry, could you just repeat them? Rexai, Vi, Zen, Panth. Zen and Panth. <laughs> okay, so Eve is slightly different than all of those. All of those characters that you just mentioned are really good in the early game. So uh, they all have significant power spikes at level three and can look for like serious gank opportunities. But Eve is a little bit different. She's a lot more opportunistic. So you want to be preying on your opponent's mistakes as an Evelyn and the fact that they shouldn't know where you are. And when you finally do show up in lanes or ideally counter ganking, you're going to be absolutely nuking the other people because uh, she has a lot of burst damage. So in the early game on Eve, you should be farming and looking to keep your lane safe because you don't have your stealth yet um but if lanes decide to overextend then you should happily gank them because you do have crowd control Uh, and with red buff like all junglers are good at level three basically so um always look for that and she's she's really snowball focused so as soon as you get your i think you rush mobility boots on her i'm not 100 percent sure i don't play a lot of eve but she's one of those characters that um when you get a lead on her, you want to be pressing your advantage across the map, so you're ganking all three lanes. And Moby Boots can help that out, uh, buying an early uh, Sheen, getting your jungle item, and then that's level six is is a huge power spike. So, I mean, it, it's all like kind of standard advice, but I would just be careful about not getting into skirmishes too early um, because she's not super strong at level three compared to some of those other junglers you're used to. So when you do back, get back into the swing of her, um, make sure you sort of just tweak your play style a little bit. Um, I'm not saying play passive, but just be a little bit more cautious of what your damage potential is. And like knowing how much damage you can take from the opponent jungler, I think would be (laughs) the other thing. Like, you know, uh, Panth, Zin, Virexi, they all have a lot of different ways built in where they are going to mitigate damage in a fight. And Eve doesn't have that. She mitigates a lot after a fight. Um, you know, she she recovers quickly, but but in the fight itself and everything, you know, she's really vulnerable to damage. So she yeah, Evelyn's one of those characters, or I always call a character instead of champions. I, Todd does the same thing. He's got me on the track. Anyways, your positioning is super important, and you want to be flanking the opponents. Um, and using your passive to to the maximum ability. So once you hit level six, you should be looking to loop in behind their mid laner and then show up in their lane and burst them down because the element of surprise is really where a lot of Evelyn's power comes from. And the fact that now her ultimate is a built-in disengage slash execute, which is just a sweet combo. Ugh, very, very few. Infuriating combo. <laughs> so many characters, like champions excuse me don't have that combo because it's just so powerful you get them below with all your basic abilities and then if they've hit you back you get to execute them and escape it's just it's just an incredibly powerful tool combined with um her empowered abilities 
and uh, and her stealth. She's pretty lethal at level six, and uh, you should always be looking to to sort of force the opponent's hand at that point in the game. That element surprise is like a really a, a good thing, and I, I guess I just want to reiterate it there because you know, like again, the, the champs you list: Rek'Sai, Vi, Zin, Dao, and Pantheon. These are not champions that are really surprising anybody. You know, they might be hiding in brush, and and then you know, yeah, they're catching you by surprise. But any champion can do that. By and large, these champions are all running at you um, mm -hmm. and planning to like really fuck you up once they get close. Eve can show up from anywhere at really a moment moment's notice and everything, and. and you know, you want to keep the opponent team on their toes. They want to be afraid of a gank at any point in time. Yeah, so maybe one more suggestion would be, like, those other characters. I played a lot of those guys, and Dom's totally right. When you want to dive the back line, you're going all in. Like, a lot of them don't have an escape button. They just engage. But on Evelyn, um, try to be more cognizant. Use it as an, uh, when you're learning her, try to focus on the map a little bit more, figure out where your opponents are warding. Uh, pink wards especially because that's that's what's going to hinder your early game um Actually, and it's also going to hinder your flanking opportunities in mid-game fights so if it's like an aram style like the silver game where everyone's mid and you manage to sneak all the way around because there's no pink wards and you've noticed there hasn't been any there or you've swept bushes or you have your own pink ward on you then you're going to be able to assassinate someone who's not expecting it uh and that's where her power really comes from it's like oh she's behind me oh, i'm dead you know well, stuff, like rengar of old and I kind of just connected and everything, but like all those champions you list, they know how they're getting into trouble and it, it's getting out of trouble that they have to figure out. Evelyn is the opposite. She knows how she's getting out of trouble. She's just gonna press R and then and then she's probably fine in most cases. Um, it's getting into trouble that she really has to think about because you know a one wrong move in, in, in that sense is really gonna screw her over and it's gonna make the get out of trouble button not very useful. Yeah, if you ever find yourself in a 1v1 and you're not, like you're evenly matched with your opposition jungler um, and there's no element of surprise, like they know you're there, you're probably gonna lose just because a lot of her kit relies on you getting the jump on them. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. So positioning is key on Evelyn. So it, it's something that not a lot of junglers you have to really worry about because a lot of them are just t engaged tanks or you know, whatever. Fighters engaged or, fighters or... Or Zyra. <laughs> Zyra jungle? No. Yeah. Uh -uh. Okay. None of that. Morgana jungle. <laughs> the only reason she was OP though is because she could like permanently W camps and like insta clear them. Yeah. Well, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. But yeah, she's one of those junglers where you just have to be... Uh, she's a little bit has a bit of a nuance. And a lot of those junglers um, often have huge followings. So I'm, I'm talking about, they like to get one trick. So the likes of Fiddlesticks, I know he's not very good, but in the hands of a good Fiddlesticks player, he is good because he has certain aspects to his game that no other character does. And Evelyn sort of falls into that that niche uh, along with characters like Shaco, who's just, I mean, also has disgusting pathing. Like he can get, he's very similar to Evelyn. I would say he's the closest probably. Uh, except he also has a hard time escaping. But, yeah. Did, uh, moving forward for a moment, thank you, Bieber, for answering that. Uh, hopefully ho hopefully our listener finds some, some use for that answer. But, Dom, was there anything about Ketchup XP in this last patch? I haven't, honestly haven't read the patch notes yet. Not in, no, not in either of them. Okay. Did you guys see the post that I threw in Reddit a few days back about fast level four for junglers? I, I saw you mention it. I didn't read any of it. So he's abusing ketchup XP, and I thought it was really interesting. Uh, he mentioned he does it. He does it every time on some champs, and only does it. Uh, you know, depending. It obviously it always depends on matchup. Da, 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 but he does it every time on certain champions. Now what he does is he starts wolves. He takes the big wolf and a little wolf, and leaves the one little wolf there and then goes over to blue and takes blue so he automatically gets plus 50 xp ketchup xp from each of the big monsters because he's still level one and they're higher level than him when they start the game then he rolls over takes gromp takes the little wolf and then rolls over and takes i think he said raptors in red and he's level four how does he manage i mean is he doing that without a leash uh you're getting a leash at wolves okay right and then so you're getting a so you're getting a leash from so this is a this is a what a red side strat that works better there. Uh, it works on both sides. It works on both sides. Yeah. Right, but, but like you're you okay, got two so people helping you versus versus one. This is great. Like, yeah, it's fine, but I think it's 
Okay, so the problem with doing this is essentially a full clear that maximizes your XP. And that's great. Right. But the problem is that the opponent inherently has an advantage on you because they get they get first dibs on level three ganks and you're not gonna be able to counter gank them. Right. So if you're playing against in high elo against an aggressive jungler, like I know this guy is I think he's a Rengar player, right? Yes. It doesn't matter though. He's he's pretty high elo, but um well, that's why he doesn't. It's, essentially, he, he, there's he doesn't anyone who can't gank like like Shivana, right? Like you're, you're yeah. hitting fast level four in Shivana because you can roll out there and then start counter jungling. Yeah, be but it, if you're not going to get punished, then this is absolutely awesome. Um, but the thing is, when you when you're playing against, I think it's matchup dependent. Like if you're playing against someone else who is also not going to be having a huge gank spike at level three, then you can afford to be greedy. As this is essentially being greedy, mm -hmm. so you get a bigger payoff later with experience and gold. Um, so yeah. You just have to be careful. Like if you're playing against Elise and she manages to get first gank off, the game can really quickly get out of hand because you weren't there to step in and help out your laners, uh, or even like sneak into her jungle and get some wards down. I mean, use of your time uh, is dependent from game to game. So I'd say it's definitely based on the matchup. When when you're against an aggressive jungler, you have to be careful about what their what their win condition is, and often the win condition for aggressive junglers like Xin Zhao and stuff is not farming but ganking. Sure. And it's not willing to game out of control. But it's cool to have the option to hard farm. So maybe we should explain it again, what what the actual route is. So you have to, you, you can't, this is also somebody had asked, can I give the little wolf to somebody to get it? No, that little wolf has to stay there. So you can't, uh, you know, have someone accidentally take one of the little, little minions in the camp or else you don't get level four. But you start wolves, you take the big wolf, you take a small wolf, you leave one up, you walk to blue, you take blue. You, then you do Gromp, Red, Raptors, and then somewhere in there you take that last little wolf and you've hit level 4. Faster than the enemy has hit level 4. And you only do yeah. this on, on very quick, power-farming, aggressive junglers that can do it essentially faster than the you, enemy can get. You have to have AoE and you have to be able to do right. a full clear without getting too low. Because if you get too low, then it also gives the opponent jungler the opportunity to invade you and kill you. Yeah. His, um, in, in his thing, he actually talked about, he, he tried it on a bunch of champions like Leash, leash List, I want to say. Yeah. Uh, and it was like Mundo, for example, was getting down to 200 life or something or 150 life by the end of it. I don't know how yeah, many Mundo times. Yeah, Mundo had 200 life, but he finished it in three minutes. Especially when I play against players that aren't as adept in the jungle. Maybe they're not so good at clearing, or they've taken an extra camp for some reason. If I do a classic basic three camp clear, like buff wolf's buff, and then I don't see a gank on, I always invade the jungle to find out what they're doing. Worst case scenario, I can just back out. I don't know how many times I catch the enemy jungler at their second buff with less than half health, and I just bop over there and kill them. Oh, because they did raptors? Because they did raptors, or they missed their pathing, or they decided to take an extra camping to be greedy. And it doesn't really matter what champion I'm playing. If I'm full health and they're half health, they're not going to be able to kill me, especially with double buffs. Um, so I, that just, is... just be careful. Like, yes, theoretically, it's a better jungle path, but the opposition has a larger window to counterplay you. That's definitely one of those types that, like, if you're a jungler, you need to try and develop that sixth sense, like just <laughs> knowing, knowing, or or suspecting what uh, what certain players are going to do and everything. And you can you can often tell based on the champion, but like if you just if you have a feeling that they are going to be doing, you know, a, a longer clear and they're going to be or a lower health clear, you know, like you, that's the sense you want to have and go and bu abuse the shit out of that. I, I can you know, speaking as a. <laughs> you know, a laner and everything, I guess, is what it really comes down to. Is nothing makes me feel better than uh, my jungler getting first blood on the opponent jungler. I have a lot of confidence in, uh, in in that person for the rest of the game. Yeah, and, and don't be afraid to get into the enemy's jungle. If you're full health and you have double buffs, it doesn't really matter what champion you're playing. Um, you're going to be pretty tough to duel for the most part, unless you're playing Seraka jungle, but then you won't be full health. So if you're someone who can clear the jungle healthy and you have the double buffs, you're in a powerful position to duel. So you've always got your flash to get out. And if you blow flash early in the enemy jungle, it's not the end of the world. It'll be back up by six or seven minutes when the team fights or skirmishes start to roll around again. And just the information that you get from invading can be super powerful for your teammates. So... Yeah, just tr just try sneaking into that jungle, dropping some wards, maybe looking for a camp that's up, stuff like that. Especially if you haven't seen them on the map by four minutes, like you know they're probably just going to power farm. Or if you run into characters like Nocturne or Master Yi, they're probably not going to gank. So just get in there and try and disrupt their game plan.
Right. And it seems like if people are doing this path, the <coughs> excuse me, average time for a gank is what, two thirty five we said or so. So yeah, most or something. the fastest people clearing it looks like Udir was at two fifty seven. So you still got an extra thirty seconds of nothing and likely he has to go back after that anyway and get life. So Yeah, so if you if you're against the Udir and he's just done the full clear and he's let's say you're you're done at two thirty five and he's just doing his red at two thirty five and having done four other camps, like you're you might catch him there with almost no HP. So that's where it becomes super sketchy for the for the farming person. Like I always have that feeling when I'm playing farm junglers in the early game, like please enemy jungler don't gank the lanes please don't gank the lanes and then 10 minutes rolls around everything's even it's like okay i win this game because i'm gonna outscale them no matter what but if if they are uh if they're putting a lot of pressure on the map i just can't match them so and but there are certain characters like shivana that can match through pressure right so shivana's yeah. actually one of the slower ones surprisingly she's three 322 mm -hmm. but and once you've done the full clear she'll then be like one of the fastest to get her on the map so. And she actually is the lowest. She got 133 HP when she ends. So basically, you, you, you pop her with one spell if you catch her. Yeah, a lot of her... Yeah, her burnout doesn't deal tons of damage at level 1, so... Makes sense. She doesn't have a shield either, like Udyr or... Yeah. Cool. <sighs> cool. I just wanted to bring that up here, too. My voice is shot, so unless you guys got something else, I gotta, I gotta stay quiet. Dom, who are you gonna pick up this season? Uh, support wise, I should try and learn like bard, shouldn't I? Yeah, you should. You'd be a great bard player. <laughs> you just, I can just see it now. Um, otherwise, I, I don't know. Maybe like try to pick up, you know, like be a competent AD carry player as opposed to just like a. It's too much work. Don't do it. Incompetent one. It's too much work. I just dropped everything down. Uh, I'm gonna pick up whatever new support they decide to release, or if they don't, you know, I'll I'll pick up Poppy. Yeah, that's fair. Support Poppy. Uh, I'm going to try and pick up Zach if I can. He's my style. Yeah, he's like. your style. So, uh, really good at engaging, disengaging. He's got it all. Good clears, good duel. I like Zach, but unfortunately, uh, I'm not sure how he... He's fine right now. But, I mean, he's not... I super think... f he got I think... nerfed into the ground. He's so OP for a while. He's so disgusting. I think Flying he'll play really well with... More. He'll play play really well with the the Trinity Force crew just because we like we we can, we can always use we can always use more we can always use more engage and everything more I feel often like, than not it's just me. I feel like every time in champ select it's like Todd's playing Garen, someone's playing a mid lane mage. Mid yeah, the mid laner doesn't have Tom's engage. Tom's playing or meta supports and then it's like Adam on A carry. So it's like uh, well, I, play, I play play more I play more Alistar and, and Rakan and that type when I'm playing with the T Force crew just because like we usually need the engage. But there was a stretch where it was like, okay, why well, we're gonna lose if I play Alistar. We need to we need Janna or I or find whatever. that when I play for Lulu. Um, assassins like the Kha'Zixes and stuff because it's fives and the, the environment is a lot more coordinated even though I can get super fed I have a hard time later in the game getting kills because people are warding or communicating <laughs> uh, not like solo queue where I can just pick Kha'Zix in any team come flying around getting kills all over the place because AD carries face check you in diamond but <laughs> you know I, I think in the upcoming season I'll definitely break out more uh, more tanks and engaged kind of characters. They don't need to be tanks, but yeah, stuff like that. Should be fun though. Diamond, here we come, boys. Here we Excited? go. It's happening. We just gotta, we just gotta start uh, rolling out a uh, schedule so we can get there. <laughs> we gotta figure out a schedule for the main show before we figure out a schedule for ranked five. So. I've been working yeah, hard yeah. on that. I've been working we'll really work hard on that. We'll work it in. <laughs> we'll work it in. All right, I'm gonna call it there because I gotta get a glass of water and rest my voice. Uh, but thanks, guys, for listening. Thanks for sticking with us for another year. Uh, we still got one more episode left in 2017. That'll be next week. And big 500 coming up. Big 500 <laughs> coming up after that, where we'll just get drunk and be stupid. Well, we got three episodes of 500, so second week of January. That'll be fun. Our first week of January, technically. Yeah. And we should record that first, uh, the first Patreon episode pretty soon, hey? Next couple weeks. Get that out there. I'm around. I'm around. Yeah. Man. Yeah, we're going to get it done. So get excited. Okay. All right, guys. Okay, guys. That's awesome. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> I was talking to you guys, but. I know okay. you were. Later, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Yeah, see ya. See you guys. <laughs>